let me ask you, uh, would you like to understand your Bible better than you do right now? Well, if you said yes, I want to encourage you in that because that is a great thing to desire. Our Bibles are the inspired word of God. They perfectly reveal to us the heart and the character of God. Our Bibles are filled with timeless truths and they help us to know God and how to live well in this life and how to live forever. Now let me ask you another question. Um, if you'd like to understand the Bible better, uh, would you be willing to admit that in the past it's been hard for you to do that? And if you said yes, uh, you would not be alone. Uh, there's some discouraging statistics around about how much people read their Bibles. Uh, in a recent survey, 82% of people said the only time they read the Bible is during worship services on a Sunday morning or, or a time like this. And as expected, a large majority of people, of Christians, people who attend worship once or twice a month, most, a large majority, have never read through the entire Bible. So it leaves the church in this interesting situation where many people revere the Bible, they, um, uh, they hold it in high regard, and they want to know it, but they find it very difficult to do. So we revere the Bible, but we don't actually read it. Now, uh, there's a couple, I think, problems kind of inherent in why there's this disconnect between our reverence for the Bible and our lack of reading it. And I want to spend a, a bit of time today kind of talking about that. That's a really important um, uh, matter for us to discuss and to, to figure out. Now, there's two problems, uh, I, I think, with a lack of reading the Bible. And the first is the way that we learn the Bible. So what I want us to do is to pretend that you and I are, uh, we're on a trip and we're going to an art museum and we're going to look at some very famous paintings. So uh, on your screen is uh, probably the world's most famous painting. The first painting we go to look at is the Mona Lisa and uh, was painted by Leonardo da Vinci in Italy in around the year 1505, a little over 500 years later. And we would stand and we'd admire the painting and uh, we would then um, walk down, um, uh, you know, down the corridor and we might find another painting. Now this one is Starry Night and it is painted by Vincent van Gogh and he painted it in France in 1889, a little less than 400 years after um, da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa. And we didn't uh, appreciate the beauty and um, uh, the, the brushwork of the great Van Gogh. And then we'll go down to the end of the hall and here hangs uh, another famous painting called American Gothic. It was painted by Grant Wood in the United States in 1930. And uh, it is likely that uh, you've seen all of these paintings, you're, you're familiar with them. And the question would be uh, for you is, how are these paintings related? Other than the fact that they're famous, how are they related? How are the subject matters of each of these paintings related? Um, and the answer is, uh, they're not related at all. Uh, Mona Lisa and the people who pose for American Gothic have nothing to do with each other. And the landscape that uh, Van Gogh painted in southern France has nothing to do with any of the other paintings. They're completely separate things and they're isolated and they're each um, stand on their own. Now, why I use that illustration uh, of this art museum is because I think a lot of times when we learn the Bible, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like walking through this museum of paintings and we learn all these stories uh, on their own, but they're isolated from each other and they're, they're very disconnected. So think of this, uh, Noah's Ark, Jesus being born in the manger. 
what do they have to do with each other? Or, or David and, and Goliath and Jesus dying on the cross, right? I mean, we wonder, okay, we, we know these stories, we've learned them at one point or another, but how are they related? What in the world do they have to do with each other? And then you throw in other parts of the Bible, like the Ten Commandments or the Proverbs, Jesus' teachings of the parables, uh, prophecies uh, of the end times. And you're like, well, how do they fit into Noah and, you know, uh, Jesus in the manger? And how does it all fit into the big picture? Because even though the Bible does tell us this one great story, it really feels like a disconnected jumble when we learn it in isolated bits and pieces. We learn a story here or we learn a verse there. And it's very hard to connect the dots and see the big picture. Now compare those three paintings I just uh, shared with you with another famous painting. And this one is The Creation of Adam. And this painting was done by Michelangelo around the year 1510. It was the same time uh, of the Mona Lisa. And this painting was painted in Italy and it is in the Sistine Chapel. It is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Now, what is different from the creation of Adam from those other three paintings is um, that the creation of Adam is part of a much larger mural. The creation of Adam is connected, connected to a larger painting of over 300 characters, from, uh, including characters like Noah and Jacob and Moses and David and Abraham and Ruth. You can see it on your screen, just the, the, the grand scope that this story that Michelangelo is telling uh, through his paintbrush. The Sistine Chapel is a mural, and that mural tells one grand story. Now, when, I, when you think about your Bible, I want you to think about the Bible is, is it's like that mural that Michelangelo painted. It tells one single story with all these great characters and, and, and you know, all these different wonderful things that we find in God's word. But again, the way we, we tend to learn this is with stories and verses here and there. And, and that's what leads to a lot of confusion. And that confusion, I think, leads to closed Bibles. Now, that's one problem. I think that's one of the reasons we we're really have a hard time getting into God's Word. The second is just the way that the Bible is organized. Now, this is um, uh, kind of a man-made thing. This has nothing to do with the, the integrity and, and the perfect nature of God's Word. It's just the way it's organized. So let me explain what I mean. So I brought a, a book here with me today, and uh, this is a novel uh, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It's part of the Chronicles of Narnia series by C.S. Lewis. And this is probably just about my favorite book. Uh, I read it many, many years ago, and I've read it many times since. And it's a really uh, wonderful adventure story. It's about two children from our world, Eustace and Lucy, and they get magically transported into this world called Narnia. And when they're in Narnia, they uh, meet up with the king of Narnia, Caspian. And Caspian and these two children go on a great journey on this boat, the, the Dawn Treader. And they're going to sail for a year and a day in search of the seven lost lords of Narnia. And um, they go on this tremendous adventure, sailing the high seas and stopping off at islands. And their journey takes them all the way to the end of the world, really to the edge of reality. And so it's just this wonderful, great uh, adventure story. And it's told in uh, chronological order and um, it just organized the way we, we read novels from kind of beginning to end. Now, our Bibles, uh, it's a single story, but it, it doesn't read like a story. It doesn't read like the voyage of the Dawn Treader. Uh, now, here, here's um, just an exercise I want you to do. Um, our 
our text today is not going to be anything in the Bible. Rather, it's going to be the table of contents of the Bible. So if you've got a Bible with you, I'm going to invite you to uh, open it up and to go to the very beginning uh, table of contents of your Bible. And we're going to just kind of walk through this uh, together and explain how the Bible is organized. And maybe you uh, never even thought about this before. So we begin with the, the law. The law is the first five books in the table of contents, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And as you read through, beginning with Genesis and Exodus, it is a chronological story. It does read very much like a novel. When we get to Leviticus, it gets a little uh, bogged down. There's a lots of details about how they are to sacrifice and worship the Lord. And then in Numbers, the story kind of picks back up again. But then when we get to Deuteronomy, we see that um, Moses is retelling much of what has happened in the first four books. And that's what Deuteronomy means. Uh, the, the dudo or duet means second. And the nomos is for law. So he's, he's giving God's law a second time. It's, it's kind of a, a, a recap. So the story is, is a bit on hold once we get to Deuteronomy. So uh, hopefully uh, that's good to know. That's how the Bible begins. Then the next 12 books in your Bible are historical books from, uh, if you look here from Joshua all the way down to Esther, those are historical books. And for the most part, they do read in chronological order until you get about halfway down into First Kings. And First Kings begins with the story of Solomon's reign over the United Kingdom of Israel. And it describes the demise of Solomon and how this the United Kingdom was then divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Then when we get to 2 Kings, it goes back and forth between the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, and it keeps going back and forth in stories of the kings and the prophets, and it goes all the way to their eventual uh, destruction, demise, and exile of both of the kingdoms. Now, it gets confusing because the story keeps flipping back and forth, and the characters have very similar names like Jeroboam, Rehoboam, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and trying to keep those separate. So it can be a lot. So then we go to the next book, First Chronicles, and you think the story is going to keep going on, but it doesn't. It takes us all the way back to Solomon, um, you know, 500 years previous. And then when we get to Second Chronicles, it stops telling the story about what happened in Israel in the northern kingdom. It only tells the story about what happened in Judah in the southern kingdom because that's the, the line of uh, the, where the descendants, uh, you know, or Jesus will come from. And that's the main line of the story is going to be from this southern kingdom. Then um, if you look, your next five books from Job to Song of Solomon are books of poetry. Um, and they are not in chronological order at all. In fact, the book of Job, we think, takes place very early in the Bible, around the time of Abraham, uh, around Genesis. And the Psalms, they're written by, um, and, and the other writings, like Ecclesiastes, are written by David and Solomon. Uh, there's even a psalm in there by Moses who wrote the first five books. So these poetry books are kind of all over the place. And let me give you an example of just how confusing uh, this can be. Uh, so if we look in our table of contents back in 2 Samuel in chapter 11, uh, David, King David has an affair with Bathsheba. And what he does um, is he ends up uh, finding out she's pregnant. She, he tries to kill uh, and succeeds in having uh, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed. And then he marries Bathsheba. And in the midst of all this, he's confronted, David is confronted uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 by the prophet Nathan. And Nathan calls him to account on this. And until Nathan shows up, David seems to be kind of okay with it. He's, he's, he's not dealt with it a whole lot. And then once he's, he's confronted with his sin, David breaks down and he says this uh, very powerful confession uh, of his sin. He writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. 
blot out my transgression, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now, where do we find David's great confession? Is it right there in 2 Samuel chapter 11? No, it's in Psalm 51. So again, it's kind of all mishmashed and intermingled. Then we get to the prophetic books. The last 17 books of the Bible from Isaiah all the way down to Malachi are prophetic books, and they talk about a wide range of things that have happened throughout the Old Testament. And you guessed it, these books are not in chronological order. The first five books are called the major prophets, and the other 12 are the minor prophets. Now, the only difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets is the size of the books. The five largest ones are the major prophets. The other 12 are called the, the minor prophets. So if you're looking here in your prophets, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Those are the books of the major prophets. Now, when we get to Daniel, Daniel is really, um, it, it takes place towards the end of the Old Testament chronologically, and he is in exile in Babylon. And then the next book in your Bible is Hosea. Hosea is the first minor prophet, and his story takes us 145 years earlier and in that northern kingdom of Israel before they had been uh, overtaken uh, and, you know, run, you know, uh, run through by a foreign power called the Assyrians. So, I'm not sure. Are you still are you still with me? Are you are you tracking this story? And and we haven't even gotten to the uh, New Testament. Now we think surely that the New Testament's got to be easier. Uh, the 27 books of the New Testament it has to be easier than the 39 books of the Old Testament. Well, well, let's let's see. Uh, we turn now to our New Testament, and we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the Gospels. They tell the story of the life of Jesus. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the, the same story of Jesus, but kind of from their, their, their point of view, kind of what they recollect. Then when you get to the book of John, it seems as things that are like completely out of, out of order. And it's not that John remembers it wrong, but he's recalling Jesus, um, the events of his life, not in order, but um, in kind of a topical fashion, and he, and he groups them kind of very differently because he's trying to teach points and make, make, make statements about who Jesus is. So he, he kind of groups and clusters things in a very different way. So the, the Bibles, those gospel accounts, don't really match up that well. Then we get to the book of Acts, and that is the one history book from the New Testament that really speaks about what happened in the church after Jesus. It's it's the story of what happens in Jesus' life from the ascension of Jesus back into heaven to around the year 63 AD. So it covers right about 30 years of history. Now we come to the end of Acts, we come to the book of Romans, and we think certainly Romans will just pick up right off, pick up right up where Acts left off. Well, uh, <laughs> that's not at all what happens. Uh, <laughs> Wouldn't that, that would be just too easy, right? Romans is a letter to the church, to the Christians who are living in Rome. And it's not a history book at all. Again, it's a, it's a letter. Now, it's the first of 21 letters written to either churches or individuals. Now, are these arranged in chronological order? Nope, not at all. They're arranged by author. The first 13 are from Paul, and then the next eight are from various different authors. And then we get to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And it's really the only, we would say, purely prophetic book in the New Testament. But it talks about things that are happening in the first century, but also things that are going to happen in the future, all the way to the very end of time, into eternity. But those things are all interwoven together. Okay. So that's our, that's our Bible. And, and, and I think you can see why, why many Christians, we would revere the Bible, we would uphold it, but we don't read it. We, or we have a very hard time understanding it. I mean, can you imagine if I took um, this book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and I just took out all different sections and I ripped out all the pages and then I just compiled them 
um, randomly kind of threw out and said, now uh, make sense of this story, um, you'd have a really hard time doing that. But here's the thing, um, you know, realizing the way we learn the Bible and the way it's organized, you know, bearing that in mind, God wants you to read the Bible. God has given us his word, his express written communication to us so that we might read it, we might hear it, we might know it. He wants you to know the one story, this grand mural, this great story that he has been telling since the very, very beginning of time. Now, my job in the next year is going to help you learn this story, this one singular story in the Bible, and to really grab hold of it. Now, to do that, we're going to use a wonderful resource that we've used in the past called The Story. And The Story, the reason we're using this is because it seeks to address these problems we have with why we don't read the Bible uh, really the way we should or as often as we would like. The story uh, is in chronological order, and it's written in such a way that it reads much more like a novel than the Bible. Now, that's not to say there's non-biblical things in here. This is, this is the Bible, but it's arranged in a way. So if we think of like that example with David and Bathsheba and then Nathan and David's confession, so it's, it's kind of all grouped together at the same, um, the same moment, the same spots in here. And it's also, a, it's not the entire Bible, it's abbreviated, and it's done so, um, not to say some parts of the Bible are more important than another, but really to highlight what is the main story, what is the main focus here, um, what is the, 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 the arc of this great story that God is telling. Now, both the Bible and the story are, are the same, and at the center of the story is Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what it's about, so that we will know Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, who was sent to rescue the world he made and the world he loves, to save it and rescue it from death, and in doing so to create a family of people to join him in bringing about renewal to this fallen creation and so that we might live with him in glory forever. That is the, the big story that God is telling. It's all about Jesus coming to save and rescue and restore a broken and fallen world that God made with perfection and is seeking to return to perfection. Now, certainly the story, um, it is not a replacement for the, the full, complete Word of God. It's not meant to be a replacement, but it is meant to be a gateway that in going through this and we get a really good idea of the, the main arc of the story, that will really help us then in the future to really dig into Scripture and have a sense of how it all fits together in what God is doing. And that is why our church, uh, beginning in, on September 4th, uh, through uh, the end of April, we are going to be focusing all our energy on reading through and understanding the story. That's why we're doing it. Now, I want to finish with sharing with you a few words on why you need to do the story. I've explained why, why we're all doing the story, but here's why you need to join in with us and why I want to challenge you to go through the story with us. Number one, this isn't just a story, and it's not just God's story. It's your story. This is your story. The story of, of Scripture, it gives context to our lives, right? My life, my existence, it only makes sense I can only rightly understand it in light of the greater story of Christ and what he's doing. That's the big story. And my life, I can only understand it in light of that. My story isn't something over here. God's already begun to tell this grand story. And I only understand who I am as I relate to that. Uh, it informs me who I am, where I come from, where I'm going, my identity, 
my purpose, my value, my destiny. It's all wound up in the story of the Bible. And trying to live without a sense of that story, we really flounder to find meaning and purpose and, you know, maintain our hope in the future. Even as Christians, if we don't understand the big story of what God is doing, we can often find ourselves floundering and wondering and discouraged and, um, you know, full of doubt. So this isn't just a story. This is your story and your life will only make sense. You'll only connect the dots in your life and really discover the truth of who you are and what God's made you to be as it relates to this story of scripture. Second, I want to challenge you to do this because God's story is not finished. It's not finished. Now, the Bible is completed. Uh, there is no more revelation to come to us. It primarily came through us through Jesus Christ and his incarnation. But God has spoken through many uh, um, saints and prophets through the years. But, but the Bible is complete. There's not going to be a newer testament coming out at any point. But here's the thing. Even though the revelation of Scripture is complete, the Jesus who it speaks of, he is alive today. He's not just a historical character from 2,000 years ago. He's alive today. He is still at work, right? And so um, we, if we want to be part of this ongoing story, we need to know um, kind of, again, where it all fits in. Now, if you came and you visited our church sanctuary, you would see it's a, it's a very historic building. It's very grand. It's, it's ornate. It's beautiful. Uh, they don't build buildings like that anymore. So just as soon as you walk into our sanctuary, there's a sense of like, there were people here before me. There were people who, who were here a long time before I ever showed up, before I was ever born. And in the same way, uh, the story is, it, 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 as, as the story existed before uh, our being, the, the story is going to exist long after we are no longer here. Uh, many saints uh, have gone on to glory and, and, and we will follow in, in their footsteps. And we, we find ourselves as part of like, we're in this one moment of time where we're part of the story. It's been told and it'll be continued to be told. And, and it's not finished. And, and so that gives like such purpose to our lives today um, because God is, is using um, uh, characters today, um, you and me, characters in the church, as he's writing the, the, this chapter for the great story of salvation, right? So it's not finished. We're a part of it. And if we want to be a helpful, effective, you know, part of this story, if we want to be a good character in this great story, you know, and used for God's good, we need to know what he's done. We need to know what he's calling us to do. We need to know what we're supposed to do and, and how we're supposed to do it. And so we only find, uh, again, our place in the story and our effectiveness right now as, as it continues to be told by knowing our origin story and, and also where it's coming next. And then finally, third, uh, the reason I want to challenge you to, be do, to do this is because this story still needs to be told. The story of who God is and what he has done, it saves lives for eternity, okay? The story of who God is and what he has done, it saves lives for eternity. That is the gospel message. And you and I are called to share this story, to invite other people into this story, to make God's story their story. And we can't do that. And we certainly can't do it well if we don't even know what the story is. So, I want to challenge you this year to get on board with the story. And um, here's what you can do. Just a very practical thing to get started. Um, you can, if you've done this before, if you've got a copy of the story, I want you to hunt it, hunt, hunt it down, dig around for it, and, and pull it out. And start reading it. Start going through it. Uh, there's enough, plenty of time for you to read through the whole thing before we even get started. Um, you can see I've got my old copy here. Uh, and if you don't have a copy, 
go out and buy one. And by go out and buy one, I mean online. Um, and you can find it, uh, there's the story.com. You can find this on uh, Amazon or CBD, uh, christianbookdistributors.com. Uh, there's, there's just a ton of places that sell this. And so get a copy, start reading it, start familiarizing yourself with this great resource, because in just a few weeks, we're going to be launching out um, on this wonderful journey of learning all about God's story. And I want you, I really want you to be a part of this with us.